Um, and we're going to start with Richard and Christine soon. And then we will head upstairs and see more works on loan from them and walk through the galleries. And Sharon Underlighter will share her works with us that are in our exhibition. And then Lee Michaels will take us into Japan. Um, so we wanted to, as we set these up, we really wanted to try and feature a wide range of work. So um, you have to go through the show in order to do that. But you know, maybe you love Japanese art, you're not so sure about Pacific Northwest or European or something. But we, um, we think that you're going to get excited about everything you see and especially about the stories that you hear. Because I think as, um, as we, as those of us who are collectors and no collectors, we know that so much of what's collected is, is personal. It isn't necessarily buying it because it's going to have a great value in the resale market. It's because of what it means to you, both in terms of your own kind of passion, emotional attachment, but also because many times these works are represent family and friends who may not be here anymore or experiences that we have with them. So um, this is an opportunity really for, um, I think, kind of intimate personal stories of what turns us on and why. Um, we're going to just start informally and try and divide up the hour or so with the three different collectors and thought that we, if there are some questions as we walk through, do ask because it's a lot easier to ask questions when you're in the room with the art and the collector than coming back to it later. Although we will have time after to also ask questions individually, or perhaps if people want to, to go to Marche and sit down and have a drink, whatever, and continue conversation. And then I also have with me some surveys. So if you are interested in continuing conversations, having a collector's club of some kind, um, whether it's in people's homes, at the museum, um, we put together a short survey that we'd love for you to fill out. Um, so as we plan the future after Living Legacies, how we continue um, to keep a community together of people who care about art and collecting. So we'll be passing those out later. But I think I'd just like to introduce Christine and Richard Soon, who um, will tell us about what you collect and why and what we have here. Um, well, uh, uh, we can talk about collecting, and of course one collects different things, um, there are different situations that bring paintings or other works to, to one's attention. And uh, when we collect, uh, I think for the most part, we try to go for landscapes, which at least is my favorite. Um, but some things uh, come as a result of inheritance. And that is the case with this painting over here. And uh, I'll just begin with my part of this. And Chris has her own way of looking at this. Uh, I became aware of this painting probably when I was about eight, or eight years old or something like that. And it was in my grandmother, uh, grandfather's uh, study at one corner, sort of like this. And his desk was right over here. And this was when I was growing up in Argentina in Buenos Aires. And uh, so uh, I knew it then and had a different frame. And uh, I liked it quite a bit, but my mother loved it even more. And um, so eventually we left Argentina, went to Canada, and then ultimately to Bloomington, Indiana. And, uh, the paintings that were in Argentina in the collection of my parents uh, stayed there because you can't bring those things in very easily. And of course, this uh, was still in my grandfather's uh, study. So this wasn't with us when we came to the United States. Well, when my uh, grandmother, grandfather and grandmother died, and eventually then these were given to my mother, and uh, they were taken out of a, this painting and a few others that were in another collection were taken out of the frame and rolled up and uh, brought by other family members to us in Bloomington. And actually, you can see there are some uh, 
parts of the paint which have fallen off as a result of being rolled up. So eventually we got, get them in, in Bloomington and my mother and I go to a frame shop to try to find a fr suitable frame for this. And, um, and so finally we found what is this right here. Uh, you know, it was hard to find something that really worked and I really remember what the other one was and could not really duplicate that. So we put that in and I never really was happy because I thought the frame was too thin for the painting, but you know, that's the way it was. Well, I had no idea uh, who had painted this, though there is a signature up there uh, and what it represented. I thought was a man harvesting corn. And I happened to f f find in the internet of uh, people actually doing this by hand with little bags to put the, the corn. And then I could see you throw them up on those big bins. So uh, that was my idea that harvesting corn. And uh, uh, I don't know if this is a gaucho because it's in Argentina. <laughs> I had no idea and I just assumed it was a uh, work from some Argentine artist, and um, that's all I knew about. So we got it here. I kept thinking it's an Argentine artist, something maybe in the 20th century, uh, early 20th century, and that's all I knew about. And uh, reading, uh, trying to read that signature was very difficult, and really had no idea what was going on. So um, that's where things stood. And then Chris starts looking at that signature and trying to decipher it. And so then she begins to find some possible documentation for this. So you come now. <laughs> well, well we, yeah. we should preface this by the fact that we're both art historians <laughs> and we are both very, very interested in um, learning more about the art that we have around us and, and that we love. So the signature in the upper right-hand corner of the painting, the more I looked at it, the more I began to think that I was seeing the word Delvaux, D-E-L-V-A-U-X. But I thought to myself, Delvaux would not have done anything like that. that it, it's, because this it's is what totally we really, this is a typical Delvaux Paul surrealist. Delvaux painting, you know, you can okay. kind Paul of see, it's a totally different, totally different. So um, when I began to look online, and which is, you know, the easiest thing to do nowadays, um, I put the name Delvo in and uh, Paul Delvo just kept coming up. I couldn't find any other Delvo. And I stumbled quite accidentally on a site that was talking about early works by Paul Delvo. There was a show that was going on in Brussels and it was uh, featuring his pre-surrealist work. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, I found examples of Paul Delvo in this post-impressionistic style that looked very much like our painting. Now, the more that I began to uh, dig deeper into the early works of Paul Delvaux, I learned that uh, Delvaux himself didn't really want to be associated with this style. And so um, at some point in the late 1930s, um, he destroyed about 80 of his works. And these were the early works of Paul Delvaux. Um, I should go back and say that some of the, the artists who he trained with were from the school of post-impressionism and he was also a student of architecture so you'll find among his early works many examples of cityscapes and city scenes but he was also painting the countryside at that time. What we are lacking is the documentation that really links this to Paul Galvo. We do not have, we do not have the provenance for this. But we did find an interesting connection between Paul Delvaux studying in Belgium and Argentina. And that's I'm going to give it back to Richard. <laughs> so um, in going to Argentina for, to visit family and then to connect with uh, art historians and scholars there, uh, the Department of Art History at the University of Buenos Aires is called the, well, the Department of Art History Julio Pairo, 
Well, I didn't know who Julio Pairo was. Well, he was uh, sort of the H.W. Jansen uh, of uh, the South America in writing in Spanish about world art and uh, Latin American art. And so he was a very prolific uh, scholar. And so the department was named after him, just as some departments of art history in Germany are also named after a famous art historian. So, uh, so I say Julio Pairo. So I find out, or we finally find out eventually, that uh, Julio Pairo had been in the Royal Academy of Brussels uh, studying art at the same time that Paul Delvaux was there. And they knew each other. And when Julio Pairo, uh, Pairo came back to Buenos Aires, he wrote a great deal about art and you know, books on, on art history and articles in newspapers about various artists, including about Paul Delvaux, with whom he communicated. And so uh, this, uh, with that signature that appears to be Paul Delvaux, uh, and these connections that we found this in South America and Argentina, uh, makes a, a possible connection as to who the artist is. Now, one of the things that when you look at all these Paul Delvaux paintings, he usually signed them uh, at the bottom here or on the other side, Paul Delvaux, and this just has Delvaux up here. Um, so that's a little bit odd. Now, it's possible that Julio Pairo might have actually put the name Delvaux up there because Julio Pairo was not only an art historian, but he also was an artist and maybe wanted to sell this painting or something and just kind of put Delvaux there. And that's all we know. So how my grandfather actually got this, I have no idea. I was too young to ask those questions. And uh, it's all these circumstances that help us to attribute it perhaps to uh, Paul Delvaux. And I must say that, as you'll see, the other landscapes that we uh, collect are quite are not surrealist at all. And if it was a, a Paul Delvaux surrealism, I probably wouldn't buy it or want it uh, like that one that you see here. But this one I do like. And when we then uh, got it here uh, in the frame, because it was sent directly from Bloomington in, in, in the original frame, you can do that when you're here. But then we uh, went to La Follette frame shop, which existed here, tried to find a better frame because I couldn't stand the one we had there. And we couldn't find anything correctly, but uh, the owner said, well, I have some extra pieces here, which is this. And so we framed it and put it on. So it's the original frame that my mother and I picked within another frame, and I think it looks fairly nicely. And so that's the story of this painting. And, and I will add one, one more thing. I, I did bring uh, some images which are on my touchpad uh, to show some of the early works by Delvaux. There are a few that are in, um, I guess it, I, from my research, I believe they're in the foundation, the Delvaux Foundation in Belgium. And uh, the one book that was published about the early works of Delvaux had a few of these examples, including a close-up of brushwork. And, the palette, the, everything about it says, I'm a Delvaux. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know, when you look at this painting, you know, it's, it's this totally flat, yeah. uh, smooth thing. So that n nothing would suggest a Delvaux if you know this star, which is what you study in art history. Not, not, not that, really. <laughs> Telephone pole is nothing, you know, just totally <laughs> natural. And I love mountains, so this is one reason I love living in Oregon. And so basically when we go collect, well, we don't go collecting, but you know, when we find things we like and can afford, uh, we try to get landscapes. And this top one we bought in Florence, not Italy, <laughs> Florence <laughs> on the coast, in uh, one of those frame shops. And uh, we didn't know, I didn't know what mountain was represented. But then the museum got this Eliza Barkas painting here. Uh, and this is somewhere in, the, in storage, perhaps. And it's uh, Mount Shasta. And it's you know, practically the same view, same, uh, same vantage point, everything about it. And, and it's by uh, someone called McCoy. And let, I'll let Chris uh, deal with that. And so. 
Here is another one which uh, I happened to find when Chris was out on a conference in October a long time ago in uh, the Peter Rabbit, I think is called the antique shop. It's the one that's not too far from Jeremy Michael, you know, that one. And I thought, well, this is a pretty good painting compared to what you often find in some of the antique shops that are maybe Sunday painters or whatever. So this was more, a little bit more expensive than I normally pay for a painting. But anyway, I got it and I'm glad I did because uh, it ends up being uh, someone that I had not heard of but who is fairly well known to at least people in the Northwest and California. Ransom Holdridge and is dated 1869. And he painted in a great deal in California, in Oregon. And uh, in 1869, right before he did this painting, he went to Europe for further lessons on painting. Um, most of his landscapes that I've seen have mountains and so forth, and that's what I would have liked. But I only have a certain amount of money and what's available, and so this is uh, what, we, what I got. And uh, I'll let then Chris just talk about these other two paintings, the two paintings. Okay, well, again, um, the research on Holdridge brought us to the fact that he was a very prolific artist, uh, lived most of his uh, professional career in San Francisco. Smithsonian has many of his paintings, and his work is, um, as we become more appreciative of 19th century landscape painting, many people are collecting Holdridge. So, that's a, it's a, it was a good investment. Again, we collect what we like. We're not out looking for particular artists. It has to be the scene that draws us to it. And that goes back to the McCoy. Well, it, it is signed. It's R. McCoy. And again, going back to my research on the internet, uh, McCoy is too darn common a name mm -hmm. to nail him down. But we did find some information about McCoy as, a, as an artist, which led us to somebody who was, um, his name was Robert Wilson McCoy. And I thought, OK, this is it. Because when he was young, he used to sign his works on McCoy. And that led me to think that we had found our artist. But when we took the painting off the wall and turned it around, the stretcher had stretcher keys in it that were actually dated, which would have put the painting much earlier than the later McCoy. This particular kind of stretcher key, which is metal, and I have, an, I have some illustrations if anybody's really interested in seeing these, um, makes this painting too early for the later illustrator, R. Wilson McCoy. So we're back to square one with this one, trying to figure out who R. McCoy is, which leads me to say that the most important thing about doing research on work, don't just look at the front. Look at everything. Look at the back. Take a measurement with the example that we showed you downstairs, because it had been reframed, restretched. You could not get any clues from the new stretcher. The new stretcher is going to be in inches rather than in centimeters. American standards for stretching are different from European stretchers. Stretcher keys, the way that stretcher is con uh, constructed, can also be highly informative of what you are actually looking at. So indeed, you have to look at all sides and at every little aspect in it. As a collector, that's one of the things that I've learned, is that you can't take anything for face value. You really have to go much deeper than that. So again, um, this particular scene, going back to the McCoy, we found postcards. It was a very common place to go, which was why Barkas was there and why R. McCoy was there. I did further research to find that was one of the train stops. There was a resort nearby, so people could easily get there. And again, one of the techniques that I've learned in tracking down landscapes is to upload the image of the scene 
and let Google help you figure out where it is, <laughs> which worked amazingly well. And once you find something out about a particular scene, you get additional key points. You get the names of cities or resorts or something that's going to be close by, and then you can continue your research. So as a collector and as, as an art historian, I do love Google. <laughs> so, any questions? Any thoughts about this? We don't want to take up too much time. There are others. I, I want to just make a comment. I think that one of the most captivating aspects of what both of you have shared today is your expertise of being art trackers. Yes. <laughs> I, in fact, it makes me realize this is another whole area that we could be seeing on television besides yes. what we do see, which is the, the, the pursuit of where it came from and what the possibilities are in the journey on the way. And we are so lucky that both of you have, are, have in your, your professional expertise the ability to like enliven this, this, this adventure that you've been on as collectors. And, and, and I just want to thank you very much. It's uh, really, thank you. It's really thank a pleasure. Very, very sweet. Well, it's, it's a, great, a great pleasure. And the fact that you know one can get so much information, not just the visual information online, but go back, for example, through uh, the Internet Archive, um, the place that does the scanning of books and journals and things like that. I was able to find, again, going back to the Del, Del Vaux downstairs, examples of some of the early catalogs in which Del Vaux, Del Vaux's work appeared. Unfortunately, nothing was illustrated in them, but they're online. You can go there and you can actually page through them. You don't have to go to your library necessarily to be disappointed that you wouldn't find it. It's going to be there for the entire world to have access to. So there's, there's richness not only with images but with text. And we are lucky to be in our age. Thank you both so much for sharing. So your turn, Sharon. Well, this is, this is quite a pleasure. And on behalf of our leadership council and all the staff, it is so great to see all of you here on such a gorgeous day in Eugene. And this is uh, uh, very exciting for us. This is obviously a great way to celebrate your 80th anniversary event for this, this wonderful institution. Um, so my experience is very different. Um, of course, we're all unique. Um, we are looking at four examples of pieces that I've in actually inherited or were given to me. Um, I can't say that I went out looking for them, that I had a passion, that I was lucky enough to have Christine be my art tracker and really like look at the potentials. But the good news is, is that it did occur to me about two weeks ago that I could really Google Shalom of Safed and Chaim Goldberg and a whole world other than the world of my personal experience with the people that bought these pieces who were my, my mother and mother-in-law opened up to me. So I'm still in the uh, excavation of hist history phase with, with this art. So let me, let me begin here because I'm going to focus on this piece which takes place in a small village in Poland of Chaim Goldberg. And this piece, which is connected to this European piece by the theme of the Jewish holiday of Passover. So um, let's me, let me begin with my mother. So I'm a teenager growing up in Houston. My mother did not go to college. She grew up in Detroit. And uh, her parents only spoke Yiddish. Her father was a house painter. And uh, her mother had hair down to here, which she braided and wrapped around her head. And her bosom came down to here. And she always wore these flowery dresses. And she was always making some kind of Jewish pastry on a pillowcase in a bedroom, because she had no counters in this small home in Detroit. And so my mother loved Yiddish. She lived in Houston. My father was a, was a businessman. And she found, she heard of a man who had moved from Europe through Miami to Houston and was in his backyard often carving giant tr trunks of trees into fabulous 
um, sinewy, uh, spiritual, um, totemic forms. And so mom would go off and we'd hear stories of how she loved going and sitting with this artist, Heim Gober, who had, had pieces at the Smithsonian, and how much she loved to sit and talk Yiddish with him. And every time she came back, she brought another piece home. And my mother did not collect art, and my mother did not have an art background. But she loved this relationship, and he opened up the world of his childhood. So what do we know about his childhood? Um, Chaim is sitting here. His father was the cobbler of the town. Um, and his father had built a clapboard house for his burgeoning family. And Chaim was the ninth child, the first son after eight daughters. So you are looking at the Seder table. You're looking at the clapboard house. You are looking at the cobbler in his bed holding up the opening ceremony of a Passover Seder, which is to do the blessing over the wine. And for those of you that are Catholic or in any other traditions, you know that blessing that wine is a really big moment. And we have the candles, the glowing candles lit on the table that illuminate the mystery of this clapboard house that, uh, that, is, that, that has been part of this huge memory that Chaim has created really for the world, which is inside the shtetl, inside the shtetls of Eastern Europe before the Holocaust. So we also have the mother who enters, and the mother's carrying two bowls of, of, ch of uh, chicken and matzo ball soup, so, which has been really great because even my kids growing up in Eugene were really able to relate, really relate to this wonderful print. So what happened was my mom, uh, collected so many pieces that as she ran out of room, she would be giving pieces to uh, Renee, my sister, who many of you know, or to myself. And we didn't live in Texas, so all of a sudden our houses started to fill up with Heim Goldbergs. And I, you know, having an art background, having actually taught here at the university, I said, I would really love this piece. So this piece is the blessing to the new moon. These are the men of that village, the atmosphere and mystery of the role of the moon in the life of a, a lunar cycle religion. You're about to see other collections today that celebrate the role of the moon and how important that is. Um, it's actually a f feminine uh, concept uh, in this religious uh, male setting, frankly. You can see the hands reaching to the sky. The, the, the way Chaim would always create and I think it's from his father, the cobbler, this sense of the buildings, the roofs, are part of the experience. And what I read about, what I Googled, was that, that um, Chaim's father uh, had built the tallest house in town. It was homemade house, but it had a very, it had the highest pointed roof. So all of his, his work of this, this lithographic, lithographic period of his life is really about the people that would come to town, the poor people that could not afford to stay in a hotel, the minstrels, the artists, um, the vagabonds, they would end up staying with them. And Chaim would do sketches and listen to their stories. So his wonderful etchings have so much to do with how he heard about a world outside of the shtetl from the people that were on the road that came through. And so uh, here we are on our road going through their clapboard house, looking at this magic moment. So what are they celebrating? What they're celebrating is a, ho a holiday that actually commemorates the story of Moses, the dawn of a people in slavery who are liberated by an Egyptian prince who was actually fished out of the Nile by Pharaoh's daughter. So how did this come into our family? So on the other side of our family, we have another wonderful woman, um, my mother-in-law, who is no longer with us, who was the director of the Jewish Museum in New York and was a trustee of the Israel Museum. And she had a marvelous collection, a very sophisticated collection. She had three very massive degrees. But, um, and really the opposite of my mom. And, and so Joy, when I was uh, 
a young mom. She said, Sharon, I want to take you with me. She lived on Fifth Avenue. She said, Sharon, I want to take you to a warehouse where you're going to meet a broker who collects, who has the biggest collection of Shalom Safeds. And I go, who is Shalom Safed? I knew where Safed was. It's this beautiful village, mountain town in Israel. It's where Kabbalah, the, the Kabbalah, was invented in the 12th and 13th century. It's a, a place where very pious and religious people lived and live to this day. It's a, a very mystical, dusty village uh, with beautiful Mediterranean light and shades of, of purples and greens and grays and mauves. And um, Shalom of Safed was born there. He uh, uh, was a pious man. Uh, his name was Shalom Moskowitz. He um, was a uh, scribe, a stonemason, and uh, not a cobbler, but he, 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 he was a tradesman. And he was able to support his family through these, these type of, of, of services in this village. Uh, in this small city at the time. And in the, the War for Independence in 1948, his workshop was destroyed. So all of his abilities, all the little projects that he did, the small businesses he provided were, were destroyed. And at, this happened to him at the age of 70. And he had never studied art. I mean, he was a, you know, a, a stone crafter. He, was, he, was, he had studied calligraphy. So he began to paint. So what does a modest man in a mountain town do at the age of 70 with his toolbox? He did the only thing he knew. He was religious. Um, he started to do his interpretation of the stories of the Bible. All of his work are stories of the Bible and would be the Hebrew Bible, or what is called the Chumash, or what is called the Torah. And so joy took me to this warehouse. It was, it had, I don't know, it, well over a few hundred pieces of all, all in slots from floor to ceiling. And she, the, she knew the agent because she was the director of a museum, but she had no idea exactly what direction she wanted to go. And she said, well, I love the s stories of King Solomon, and I love Jewish holidays. So he started pulling out paintings. And she fell in love with this uh, immediately. And she said, Sharon, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, I was like looking at it and going, well, why does Pharaoh's daughter look like a man? And why is the whole court, these are such, and you know, I'm like looking at it with my master of fine arts eye and I'm going, this is very primitive. And then I realized that all of his art is primitive. I mean, of course it's primitive. He'd never painted before. He's like coming from a tradition that he literally created, he invented himself. And also, he was a Kabbalist. So he knew mystical significances of numbers and names and Hebrew letters that are evaluated by um, cosmological significance. So all these paintings are packed with information that I would love for Christine to art track. But it is, it is, but it is, you know, it is so wonderful to be able to think of Joy, who's no longer with us, to know that this painting resided in her gorgeous bedroom and that the holiday that she loved the most when she would come and do Seder with her grandchildren to come for Passover is the piece that she left me. Um, and uh, we, it's a great conversation piece. I mean, obviously, you know, I've mentioned this before. Isn't it interesting that Moses looks like he's like on a 1950s television? I mean, that he's, he's getting fished out of the bulrushes, but we've got that whole Egyptian, you're either looking at it this way or this way because he didn't paint and he, didn't, he, he wasn't interested in doing a three-quarter view. And so we have, um, a conversation going on, and, and, and he also, at the, at the bottom of all of his paintings in Hebrew, has the piece from the Bible that he's lifting the story. So the, the only other thing that I can say about um, what really connects all these pieces 
is that in the historic tradition of these families, and also in the taste of my mothers, my, my forebearers, and what will go on to Shoshana and Ariel, our daughters, is this sense of, of, of the cosmos. The cosmos is very important. And the cosmos can be pulled down from the sky and brought right onto your table. And you can, you can really time travel. Um, I wasn't planning on talking about it today, but I feel like I should briefly, is that this uh, Shadur uh, uh, um, paper cut is done by a woman who I once visited with when I was in Israel and I didn't know she was a really great paper cutter of Israel and she knew that my name is Sharon but in Hebrew it's Sharon she knew that our daughter Shoshana who's now a doctor that our name Sharon and Shoshana come from a passage from the Song of Songs about Arab Shoshanim the evening of the lilies, the evening of the roses. This is a piece about a paradise garden. And she just gave it to me. And I learned the significance of it. And then much later learned that this was really great that she gave me this piece, because I didn't know anything about paper cutters in Israel. So, so all these you know, uh, pieces are um, eclectically uh, in my home. And I have the, the real thrill of being able to remember my mother in 95 degree Houston weather standing outside with Chaim and, and, and get connecting to her childhood and, and having the magic of this relationship with this great shtetl artist who collected all over the world and that for joy to connect with the country of Israel where she had her second home and spent a lot of time looking at Mediterranean light and trying to understand the significance of how the Bible speaks to art because she was a director of a Jewish museum. So um, it's a thrill for me to be able to share these stories with you, but even more importantly for, for me to rediscover my roots from these great women and their journeys in their life. They, they did not bring me to collecting, but they brought me to being a very happy recipient of a storehouse of treasures, which will go on to our daughters and hopefully to the sons and daughters. And I am about to be a first-time grandmother, so this is really great. I kind of have a sense that these paintings and all these pieces will go forth. Why is the patriarch in bed? Yeah. Okay. Well, they look. Look, we've got a table and benches, and we got nine children. Okay. So they obviously he was a cobbler. He made shoes, not furniture. Uh, although he did the house. So this holiday of Passover uh, has a book that tells you how to perform your seder with your friends, which we do every year here in Eugene. And you're supposed to recline. The first thing it says is this is a long meal. You're having lots of wine. You're telling the story of Moses coming, and you're going on and on, and this thing goes on for three and a half or four hours. And so even in this era, he chose to recline because, and Chaim remembered him. And it's possible he slept in that room. Remember, this is a small house. I mean, I don't really know the answer to this, but I can tell you that you're supposed to recline, and you're supposed to be very relaxed during the Seder. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any others? Just to add that one thing is that if you look at uh, images, mosaics, and so forth of Romans at table, they always recline around the table, and so did the Greeks. And when you see uh, early Christian uh, images of Christ and the apostles, and they're having their Last Supper, they're also reclining. Of course, because the Last Supper, they were at a Passover Seder. Jesus was Jewish. He was at a Passover Seder. <laughs> they were having a Seder. But that, I've never noticed that, and I'm going to look for that in. You know, not the Da Vinci thing with that table. It's right. a total. It's <laughs> 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 a big house. Oh, yeah. Right. So, More room. Um...
this is a Japanese fireman's boat. <laughs> and I used to do this lecture with that on, but it's a quilted fabric and it's very hot. And it was used by Japanese firemen before they went into fire. They wet they wet this to act as insulation. Now actually, Dean has it on inside out because that's how I gave it to him. When they weren't fighting fire, they had the other side, they had this side out, this kind of showed who you were, and for ceremonies they had um, this side out. Um, I need a small volunteer. I, uh, like I, <laughs> One that is, she's in the business mode. Very um, Can that take it along? Um, she, she would also wear these gloves and this hat, which actually has probably half an inch of padding and a bill. And it would be, I don't know why. No problem. I wash my hair. Okay. Well, <laughs> I need one more volunteer for the fireman's pants. <laughs> I spent a year and a half in Japan as a medical officer um, and learned about the Japanese culture. I'd had no experience other than one class in Far Eastern history when I was an undergraduate. And I didn't have any art knowledge. Um, but Japan, Japan is a very uh, image-rich, colorful country. And uh, I got interested in the billboards and the advertisements and the, the, the imagery that was in the country. Um, I didn't get interested in Japanese prints at the time. Um, I did purchase one print, and uh, that was the extent of it at the time. Um, this collection, one of the drivers for it is that I spent three summers um, in, various for, in various firefighting situations. One was a uh, Department of Natural Resources in the state of Washington, and then two summers with a municipal fire department. So I kind of had the bug about, I mean, every boy wants to grow up and be a fireman, and I got to do it. So, um, so I was interested in firefighting and firemen. Um, firemen, you can tell in pictures, are in these quilted uh, Shashiko Hanton coats. They're tattooed. They have a sweatband, and they bring ladders. And these are children imitating firefighters. Um, they're tattooed. They've got coats. And the ladder is being held up by these poles, which have hooks on the end. Um, this is a, another print. There's, not, there's a couple firemen down here but you're supposed to get the image from the fact that the sweatband is falling off and the ladder's being held up. Uh, fire was a constant threat in Japan. 
the houses were made of wood, they had tatami mats, the walls were paper, they heated it with charcoal, they used candles and lanterns, and it was a setup. And the firemen were also usually in the building construction trades. They were carpenters and uh, building erectors. Uh, and they had a conflict of interest because <laughs> in, in, in order to stop the fire, they would tear down several houses to create a fire break. And these poles with the hooks on the end um, were the tools that they used. Uh, there, in, in the major cities, there were fire towers with a guardsman on top, and that person had a bell that he rang to alert the population. They had bucket brigades, they had pumps, um, and they pulled down the buildings if they needed to. But there were recurrent fires in Tokyo. Um, they were called the Flowers of Edo, the, the, the fires were. And some of the fires were even, had names associated with them. Uh, which gets me to the first print down here, which has to do with a fire in the late 1600s called the Greengrocer's Daughter's Fire. Um, this woman up the ladder going to the fire tower is Osishi. And she was a real person. She became even more famous um, after her exploits, which I'll describe in a minute, um, she uh, has become the subject of kabuki plays, uh, other stories. Um, she's the greengrocer's daughter. And so the story goes, and it's probably real, at least at the beginning, it's been considerably elaborated. Um, there was a small fire in Tokyo and the firemen came, and Osishi was, and her family were evacuated to a monastery, which was on the edge of town, safe, outside the fire. And there she met a young monk who, with whom she fell in love. And of course, he was cloistered, not supposed to have a girlfriend, she was not supposed to see him, but that didn't stop the two young lovers. And it didn't stop Osishi from starting another fire, a big one this time, so that she could go to the monastery to see her boyfriend. <laughs> and um, this didn't work out so well, and something, you know, like 100,000 people perished in the greengrocer's daughter's fire. So she um, uh, had a problem. She appeared in court, and the judge said to her, well, you're 15, aren't you? And she said, oh, no, sir, I'm 16. Well, the cutoff between the death penalty and being let off as a juvenile was 15 years old. So her honesty got herself, got herself uh, killed. Mm -hmm. So she's um, a star of the fire scene in Tokyo. Um, let's move on to some of the other trip um, pictures here. Um, this is a fireman with, um, in full regalia. This is a, what's called a matoy, which is a signaling device. You can see his buddy down here in the flames. Um, the firemen came in, in brigades um, for each neighborhood, and you um, subscribed like uh, you did 
early in America to fire protection uh, associations. And uh, this, these pictures are both from Yoshitoshi. This is, excuse me, from the series 100 Views of the Moon, and there's, a, there's the moon through the smoke. Um, this is from another series, uh, 32 Women, that y Yoshitoshi did. Both of these series are from the late 1800s, um, what's been called the decadent era. The early collectors of prints thought these were not worth collecting because they weren't classical. And, but I don't care about that. I like them anyway. Um, this is look, the, the title of this is Looking Expectant. She's a fireman's wife who's waiting for him to come home for the fire. And the, the badge on the back, which identifies the brigade, is the same on the two prints, done at, done at different times. Um, firemen were popular in culture. They were the heroes of the time. Um, this print is for children. It shows young people. But the brigades are set up in the order of the Japanese alphabet. And it's a learning game to learn the alphabet from the number of the different fire brigades. Um, this group of women are, uh, are unique. Um, they're from the Ooku, which was the shogun's Women's Protection Brigade, or harem. It's been described in different ways. Um, th they were women of the countryside who the shogun brought to Edo, brought to Tokyo, for internal, for protection in the palace within the walls. They didn't want samurai or other people who were politically risky or had affiliation. So these women um, were the guards and the firefighters um, within the palace. Um, when I initially purchased this print, I didn't know what was going on here. Obviously, there's a fire, but these uniforms were pretty weird, including these pointy hats. <laughs> and these are fighting weapons, halberds. They're not the hooked firefighters units, but um, there was a show at the Japanese Society of Japanese Costumes, and they had a hat like this, and it was from the Ooku. Um, I was showing these prints to uh, uh, a Japanese art history class, and there was a young woman who was Japanese from Tokyo, and she said that there is now a soap opera on uh, Japanese TV with regard to the Ooku and the intrigues that went on with the uh, firefighting and guarding women. Um, so, um, this triptych is a, is a map of Tokyo, Edo, with the various fire brigades indicated. And so you had a, you get a description of the neighborhoods, um, where these brigades were. Um, this is a triptych of um, the shogun in his palace observing ammunition testing. It's not quite fireman related. Um, when I purchased this print on the internet, I didn't know what the subject was about. Um, in following up with the sons. Um, I've learned a lot about Japanese culture by either seeing these for the first time and, have, and kind of placing them within their subset or doing some further research. Um, when these prints were being sold, um, the, the, the culture was quite literate. Um, the literacy rate in Japan from the 1700s on was as high as any place in the world. And there was a lot of common knowledge about um, uh, 
cultural folklore, um, books were being produced, travel guides. There was a lot of information for people to read. And so the people who purchased these prints would be familiar with the subtext of these. Um, and uh, a person like myself who's not Japanese picks that up to some degree. Um, these are not actual firemen. These are actors. And there was a conflation of heroes that went on. And the actors dressed as firemen. In the next panel, um, actors are dressed as firemen and sumo wrestlers. Um, but again, the, you can tell because they've got sweatbands, tattoos, and special coats, although that guy is a little more stripped down for a fire than I think is safe, but <laughs> it's, it's up to him. Um, this print commemorates a famous street fight that occurred in Tokyo between firemen and sumo wrestlers. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find anything more than that, but uh, again, you can tell the, uh, the real firemen from their tattoos, and if you knew who was playing Kabuki during this year, you would knew, know who the various actors are because they're all actors. Um, they're, it's kind of a fan print. I mean, a, not, a, not a fan fan, but um, fanatic print. And so are these. These are actor prints. Um, the prints got made in a very commercial fashion. The artist was responsible for the image. Um, the image, and he, had some, and he had some control over the color that was used. But he was doing the work being commissioned by the publisher. And the publisher said, well, we're going to have, we need images for the next Kabuki season. Um, we need a travel log. We need this, we need that. Uh, would you produce it? Would you draw it? So after it was drawn, um, it went to the carvers, very subspecialized. Um, there were carvers for hair, because that was the most tedious and difficult thing to carve. Um, they carved the wood block, and then the blocks were printed. Um, in this print, there were actually, and I forget, several artists involved. It's, a, it's called a pasted print, and different um, artists were commissioned to do the tower, do the actor, do the landscape. And that, there, was a, there were fans of certain artists, so you got a little bit of everybody on on a print like this. Um, certainly. Questions? Martin? What is the fellow who's actor doing with the weapon? Why is he holding it like that? He's about to commit the right part. Is he? Um, he's, this is a kabuki, this is a scene from a kabuki play, and he's a samurai who's um, superior, whose daimyo uh, was in the civil, was in the Japanese civil wars and lost. And his castles, his boss's castles going up in smoke. And that makes him a failure. And so he's about to kill himself. So, um, but he was known, uh, I mean, this is, this is a story that was the actual occurrence was 200 years before this print was made. Um, yes? Did all the firemen have tattoos? Uh, gangsters had tattoos, and still do. 
Um, tattoos were, you know, people who were, most of the townspeople did not have tattoos. So it was not um, socially accepted, unlike the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. These actors are obviously wearing masks, uh, it seems to me anyway, in these. So no, they're, they're, they're not. It's makeup. It's makeup. Okay. It's makeup, and it's exaggeration. And okay. part of the kabuki performance was what's called a mie, a, a, a stare. Okay. And so they were caught at, at doing that. <laughs> um, and if you come up and look closely, this actor and that guy are the same actor. Um, because they were famous, these prints were done at the same time, um, actually by the same artist. So um, there was mileage to be made from portraying this, this individual. Any other questions? Thank you.